There is the so-called secure attached style. This typically emerges in childhood when there's a very predictable care um, caregiver carry a uh, relationship between child and most often mother, but it can be father too or other caregiver. So that's one style of attachment. The parent leaves, the child gets a little distraught, but then can distract itself doing other things or just simply do other things because they have a high degree of intrinsic knowledge, not the thought, but intrinsic calm. The autonomic nervous system doesn't feel any need to ramp up because the mom returns. Then there's the so-called insecure attachment styles, and there are a bunch of different ones, but those are the ones where it's really stressful when the parent leaves. It's not clear they're going to come back, and when they come back, it's not clear that there's, they're going to reestablish the bond, the child will feel uh, supported, etc. Here's what's fascinating. Those same neural circuits are repurposed for romantic attachment in adult life. Now, one important point, it's not one for one in the sense that Let's say it's a young, a young girl, and as a baby and a young child, she had a secure attachment to her father and an insecure attachment to her mother. This girl grows up, and you might say, well, she had a good relationship to her dad, so she's going to have a good secure attachment style in her adult heterosexual relationships. Ah, often it's not the case. They will transplant or superimpose the insecure attachment style to the, to the mother onto male relationships, but have great relationships to female friends, for instance. So all of that is in us. And then you were talking about breakup. The way that grief works in the brain and nervous system is that there are three sort of factors that are mapped in our consciousness and our subconscious. And these are space, time, and this notion of closeness, which is attachment. Space and time is very simple. It's where is the person that I love and when will I see them next? If you have a relative that lives overseas and you know they're alive, you're not going to grieve them. You might really miss them, but you're not going to grieve them the same way you would if suddenly you get the note, unfortunately, that they passed away. And then attachment is how close you are to them, like how critically you rely on them for internal s control and support. And that doesn't mean they have to be an immediate caregiver. It could just be like a really good friend that just your knowledge of him just makes you feel good. You feel better in the world. But what's interesting is that the grief process itself is about restructuring this map. This map, think of it like a tripod. It's got three pieces, space, time, and closeness. When someone dies, it's very confusing for the brain because where are they in space? Well, the body is put someplace. Maybe it's cremated, maybe it's not. We have notions of a spirit, and that depends on one's orientation, a soul or a spirit, okay? Or if you don't, then you don't. Then, then where do they go, right? And then time, when will you see them again? N there's the never. You'll never see them again. And the closeness component remains. And so there's an untethering of this map. And so there's been brain imaging studies, um, beautiful work by... Uh, Mary Frances O'Connor at University of Arizona, showing that if you look in the brain in people that are in grief from loss of a really strong attachment, the state of brain and body that gets flipped on is a motivational state. It's exactly the same circuitry in the brain that one sees active if someone very hungry is put just outside the wall of some delicious food. So grief is a motivated state to, to bridge the distance in time and space, and yet it's impossible and so the process of grief is a gradual waning of that motivation and a gradual shift of the memory of the person into some concept, whether or not it's a soul, whether or not it's just the past, whether or not it's their energy. You know, again, it depends on what the forebrain of that particular person believes, shifts that concept of that person into a place where the brain is comfortable. There's no more autonomic arousal. There's no motivation. And we've all experienced this. If you've had a loss, and I've, I've had a loss, for instance, where my graduate advisor died and I adored her. And every once in a while, her daughter will call me from her cell phone and she kept the same number on that ph phone and the name and everything. So every once in a while, it'll ring Barbara Chapman and I'll reach for the phone. And then there's this moment where I'm like, oh, goodness. When there's a breakup, it's exceedingly hard, especially if the person is young. You know, if you look at suicides after breakups, those are far more common in younger people than they are in older people. Why? Because the relationship represents the whole future. They have no concept that they're, they know there are other people, but it sort of feels like the whole world is, is shutting down. So in breakups, what's happened is the person is no longer available in time and space, but it's almost as if you have to, the brain has to think that the person is gone in time and space. This has become much harder with social media. Now we are constantly renewing that the person is still there. And so love and the loss of love and the death grief are virtually identical. It's that motivational state. And this is why it's so hard to not reach out to somebody that you really miss and want back. You know, how comfortable one is 
feeling their feelings is male or female is going to strongly dictate how quickly one moves through grief. This is the same thing as trauma. The more willing someone is to feel the full depth and intensity of the feelings that they associate with that trauma, the more quickly they're going to move through the trauma. You know, people use a number of strategies. They use distraction. They use states like uh, they sublimate to things like anger um, and avoidance of various kinds in order to not feel the traumatic feelings or not feel the breakup. People will, you know, uh, try and self-soothe with alcohol or try and self-soothe with multiple new partners or whatever it happens to be. It doesn't work because this map of space, time, and closeness needs to be fractured. And the only way to do that is for the brain to have to confront the reality, which is that whether by death or by, by breakup, they are no longer available. It's like the food on the other side of that wall is gone. It's just not there anymore. Uh, or that the food that was accessible now there's a wall in between and you will not get through it. And you know, you can see this actually in animal studies that are kind of hard. They're actually very hard to watch. You'll see the animal perseverate, literally damage its own body trying to get through a barrier to something it's highly motivated to see. People do that post breakup. They usually do that by talking to everybody about the breakup, um, which is its own form of perseverating on the motivation. What did I do? What did I do wrong? This and that. And some of that analysis is healthy. Some of it's not. Now, why would one group be effective at dealing with breakups. It's probably the ability to really feel the full intensity of how sad it is and be able to confront that. And I think from a very early age, um, there's a, an ability that at least, I'm sure it transcends to women too, learning to pack down feelings, right? And so when are we really talking about when we're talking about pack down feelings? I'm not a psychologist, but what we learn is top down control, forebrain to autonomic control. It's the same thing like, I don't want to jump off the high dive or I don't want to do this public speaking, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of like, I'm just going to force myself. I'm going to David Goggins it, right? Grief is, a, is an autonomic state. Uh, we say it has valence, it has negative valence, but it's high levels of autonomic arousal with a negative connotation because you can be high levels of autonomic arousal with happiness, right? You can be very alert and aroused and happy, very alert and aroused and sad. It's very alert and aroused and sad. And yet, we learn how to tamp that down. It's reducing our heart rate. It's going to work each day, being a functional human being. You know, there's a lot of that rather than allowing ourselves to, you know, sob uncontrollably into a pillow. So I think the better that we can lean into the emotional states that we fear the most, but in a controlled way where we're not harming ourselves or other people, the better. The more that we try and avoid that, and we try and sublimate or just, you know, and I've done this, so I'm speaking from experience, you know, I would use the anger or the sadness from an experience to just work 10, 10 times longer, 10 times harder to just get that much more focus. You're taking that autonomic arousal, that narrow aperture and that energy, and you're putting it onto something that moves your life forward. So in some cases that's good because you still need to function and it give, but it can give you the, here I'll just say, it, it gave me the illusion that I was working through something because you get all the accoutrements and rewards of hard work. But what you don't do is remap that space time closeness map. And then you find, I guarantee you find yourself five or 10 years later, wondering why you're so exhausted or why certain things in life aren't going well. And it's because when they say you haven't dealt with the loss, you never actually allowed yourself to feel the feelings. But once you do, it's like a valve, it releases.